It's my great privilege to introduce a teacher of mine and our keynote speaker for this evening's celebration. Dr. Josh Miller is an associate dean and professor at the Smith Smith College School for Social Work, where he focuses primarily on anti-racism anti work and psychosocial capacity building in communities recovering from disasters. In addition to his teaching at Smith, Dr. Miller responds to disasters locally, nationally, and internationally, including September 11th, Hurricane Katrina, the Asian tsunami, and earthquakes in Haiti and China. He also conducts anti-racism workshops in social service agencies, hospitals, and schools. His most recent books include Psychosocial Capacity Building in Response to Disasters and Racism in the U.S. Implications for the Helping Professions. Smith College School for Social Work is approaching its 20th anniversary of becoming an anti-racism institution, and Dr. Miller serves as chair of the Anti-Racism Consultation Committee. As will become evident in his speech, Dr. Miller believes that white people carry an obligation to confront racism every day and for all of our lives. Please welcome Dr. Josh Miller. I felt like I had to run up here just to <laughs> kind of show Bill that I still have a little bit of energy left after walking here tonight. Um, I just want to say that I am really honored to be speaking to you at such an important commemoration of one of those really rare moments um, in world history where humanity collectively embraced a moral position, a position that, as we've heard earlier, was informed by two world wars and a horrific genocidal campaign against Jews, gypsies, and other groups. So I'm really proud of living in a community where there is a human rights commission, and one that is active, that's vibrant, and that is relevant. So I just want to thank the commission for inviting me to speak to you all tonight, um, and also for all of you who have turned out for such an important event. I just want to briefly tie in what I will be talking about with today's uh, anniversary. The efforts to establish the Universal Declaration of Human Rights involved many countries, many people, but there was one person in particular, a Polish Jew named Raphael Lemkin, whose life work really was centered on pass making sure that this was passed. Um, he was a Polish Jew and an international lawyer, and after the UN adopted this resolution, there was a lot of debate in this country about whether it should be ratified in the United States. And President Harry Truman supported it, and he spoke out on behalf of, of the resolution, but there was tremendous resistance in the United States Senate. And uh, as Samantha Power, who has written a book about genocide called A Problem from Hell, sounds like we have a Samantha Power fan in the audience, um, the most prominent opponent of ratification, and I hate to say this to all the lawyers in the room, was Alfred T. Schwepp, who was chairman of the American Bar Association's Committee on Peace and Law through the UN. Powers quotes Shep as Schwepp as saying that his opposition was based on the following, and I'm quoting now. If I want to drive five Chinamen out of town at gunpoint, it does not mean that I intend to destroy all 400 million Chinese in the world. Okay. That was said at a Senate hearing. It's an interesting example because Chinese residents, and I use the term resident and not citizen because at the time that I would be talking about, they could not become citizens. Chinese residents of the United States had been chased out of communities at gunpoint. And they were, they were the targets of pogroms the city of Seattle was, emptied all of its Chinese citizens at gunpoint out of the city after the Transcontinental Railroad was built. And the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which was signed by Chester Arthur, and by the way, that was a time when immigrants from Europe were being encouraged to come to this country. In fact, probably many of us in this room descend from 
people who emigrated to this country more or less around that time. That act was not repealed until 1943, five years before the declaration was passed at the UN. Okay. Seven years before the United States Senate was debating this. And the United States Senate, senators needed to be reassured, and they were reassured, that this declaration did not cover, quote, lynchings, race riots, and segregation. There was also anti-Semitism that was directed at Lemkin, who was tire tirelessly pushing for ratification by the United States Senate. So this declaration was not ratified in 1950, and its binding power for all nations to subscribe to its principles is still contested in this country. So this is still an unsettled matter, even though we've made a lot of progress. I just I, I want to say that I don't find this surprising given our country's history of racism, which I now want to turn to. Everybody here knows we have a constitution. It was followed by a Bill of Rights. And it was based on the notion of a social contract between the government and its people. And we all know about the inalienable rights like uh, freedom, security, equality. But I think, again, everybody in this room is aware of this. Many of the drafters of the Constitution and our early presidents held African Americans as slaves and advocated for and perpetrated and participated in genocide and ethnic cleansing of Native Americans. Our first 12 presidents, out of our first 12 presidents, only two, the Adams, did not, were not slaveholders. So, as the social philosopher Charles Mills has said, there was the social contract, but there was an underbelly of the social contract, which he terms the racial contract. And this racial contract was an implicit justification of racial categorization, and justifying group distinctions based on an illusion, race, but with very real consequences, racism. If we pull out a dollar bill, or a $10 bill, or a $20 bill, we see the pictures of slaveholders and genocidists in this country. There are very few countries that still have people with that kind of history so prominently displayed in such public domains. And part of why I'm bringing this up is one of my themes tonight is how racism has been part of this country's social contract from the beginning, and it is so prevalent, including on our money, that it seems normal. And if we think about the ways that this country is not a democracy, we often talk about how it is a democracy, one of the examples is the U.S. Senate, where a underpopulated, mostly white state like Wyoming has as many senators as a multiracial, densely populated state like California or New York. This descends from this racial contract, and it's really a legacy of what it took to form a nation when many of the states who were forming that nation engaged in slavery. So as I said, part of why I'm going over this is it's, it's part of the normalization of, of racism that persists to this day. And while when we think of racism, we're often, in our minds, we're often thinking of genocide, slavery, and ethnic cleansing that was central to the founding of the United States. Or maybe we're thinking of the racial codes or the informal slavery where African-American men were first forced forced to work in mines and in factories for no pay after the Civil War, or lynching, or Jim Crow, or segregated schools which were still permitted in this country until 1954. I guess what I want to say is, thankfully those are not what we are encountering today, but racism is still very much with us. It's part of this country's DNA from birth, it's a resistant strain that mutates and endures. It doesn't look the same, but it has not completely gone away. We see it structurally. 
We see it by who gets stopped, arrested, convicted, and incarcerated in this country, not people who look like me. We see it in who gets asked to show photo IDs when they're using their credit cards in shops, including shops in Northampton, according to my colleagues and students of color. Or who's being followed when they enter the store. Again, not somebody who looks like me. Or in our increasingly segregated neighborhoods, which has been a trend that's been going in the wrong direction. The arc has not been leaning the way we would hope. When we notice who are the CEOs or, or the heads of Fortune 500 companies or baseball team owners, um, who are the majority of the elected politicians in this country, then we do start seeing people who look like me. We see it in the notion of whiteness, which is a concept that eventually conscripted many European immigrants who were not initially considered white. The Irish, Italians, Jews, Greeks, for example. And we see it in the veil of invisible, invisible to white people, privilege, which many people in this room benefit from, even if we consciously deplore it. And we see it in stereotypes, which research has confirmed over and over again, shows that white people hold stereotypes towards people of color, which inform seemingly benign choices in life. Where do we live? What schools do we send our children to? When do we decide to cross the street? What we think, what is said, what is expected of other people. There's been lots of studies that show that white people who are asked if they harbor feelings of racism and they disavow that are shown pictures of African-American faces, their heart rates, their eye blinking rates, their sweating all increases while it doesn't do so when they're looking at pictures of white faces. Reverend Andrea Vazian said to me many years ago that racism is in the air that we breathe. It's so ubiquitous, it infects us all, and it appears to be the normal state of affairs for those who benefit from it, which is reinforced by institutions, by public discourses. And I know that we've heard a lot of criticism of President Obama tonight, much of it warranted, but I do want to say that he is our first African-American president, and some of the opposition to him and to his laws is because of his race. And where does the unbending Republican opposition to the Affordable Care Act come from? It's, it's never presented as a racialized discourse, but I want to come back to it. So a lot of things are framed as neutral when it comes to race. And it becomes part of people's internal maps. It's not just what's outside of us, it's also what's inside of us. And this leads to cognitive and emotional distortions. A common form of racism today is what is often called microaggressions, which are common acts of disregard. They're per perpetrated by people with race privilege, white people, and they're directed at people of color. It's usually beyond the conscious awareness of the person who's engaged in a microaggression. Usually the person who's doing this, if you ask them, do you, are you racist? Do you have stereotypes? The answer would be no. Examples of microaggressions are expecting members of a targeted group to speak for all members of that group, having lower or at times unreasonably higher expectations for members of that group, unconscious mistrust, rendering people invisible or ignored, or even simple body language. There's studies that show how close people stand to one another or whether they make eye contact are all influenced by one's race. I also want to say that um, my students of color and colleagues of color often talk about 
experiencing microaggressions in my school, Smith College School for Social Work, which, as Jordana has said, has made a 20-year commitment to becoming an anti-racism institution. And virtually all of my colleagues of color describe how, as professors, they are asked questions by students that consistently challenges their credibility. What do they really know about their topic? Where did they get their facts from? And I have to say that I've been teaching for decades, and I have never been challenged that way. If this is not bad enough, having things like microaggressions still part of um, our interactions between people, we have a Supreme Court that's just dismantled one of the few protections that really contributed to the bend in the arc of human progress towards social justice, the Voting Rights Act. And voter ID laws have sprouted up since that decision in many states, and not coincidentally in my opinion, many of the same states that have been actively resisting the Affordable Care Act. As many people have said, the price for what can be done is un can always be undone, and the price for freedom is eternal vigilance. But having said all that I have just covered, I just want to say that I do remain hopeful. Because despite our history of racism, we have made progress. What was considered legitimate and normative in the past is unacceptable. As Bob Dylan said, if I don't climb to the top of the hill, I know my baby will. And I would add to that, perhaps, his baby's grandchildren, or their grandchildren, or grandchildren. I'm hopeful because if we step back and we look at the moral arc of human progress over the centuries and decades, it does bend towards racial justice. But, as President Obama said, it doesn't bend on its own. It's because of the laying of many hands on that arc. And that's what I want to finish up with, which is how did that arc bend in, in, in the direction that it does point to, and what can all of us do? Of course we need leaders, and I've been very conscious of, and I know most people in this room have been thinking of this also, about the passing of Nelson Mandela. And we need leaders of his caliber, and when I think of him, I think of his courage, his fortitude, his vision, but also his immense compassion, and I want to come back to that. And people like Martin Luther King Jr., who gave his life in the search for freedom after leading perhaps the most transformative social movement that this country has ever known. But it's not just leaders of that caliber. Um, their search, their quest for social justice and racial equality has depended on millions of people who shared their vision and who worked in their own ways to achieve it to achieve this, people like us in this room. So what are some of the steps we can take to keep bending humanity's moral arc towards justice? I want to suggest four broad things. The first is to see and hear racism. While most people of color are, aware, are well aware of this, many white people are not. And without this step, people do not know what we are confronting. We have to train, particularly white people, have to train one's eyes, one's ears. And not only because white people are not ensnared in the web of institutional racism that people of color experience all too often, and are often unaware of its existence, because that's one of the insidious things about this racial contract is it not only granted racial privileges to white people, but it also did it in such a way that those privileges are often not visible. So I guess what I want to say is that um, every day, in every room, at every meeting, while watching every television show, while walking down the street, while going to the Iron Horse, while running in the hot chocolate race, Everywhere, we need to notice who's there and who's missing. Who are the leaders? Who are the spokespersons? 
and what images are being used, and where did these come from? And although Northampton has become a much more diverse community than it was when I moved here over 30 years ago, why are Springfield and Holyoke so much more racially and ethnically diverse than Northampton? How did that happen? Or more importantly, why is it still that dynamic? I think what we have to do is similar to what happens to the hero in the film The Matrix, which is we have to remove whatever rose-tinted glasses any of us, and I include myself, may be wearing, and notice the real world we inhabit. So that's the first thing. White people in particular have to listen, look, and notice. But secondly, I want to say that we're not alone, and we must do this work together. Racism by its very, very nature is the ultimate form of isolation. It's based on dehumanization and scapegoating of other people. Human connection acts as a solvent against the rust of racism. And just like the civil rights movement in this country, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, all social movements take many, many people who do very different things in our own ways, but working towards a common goal, responding to this web of racism with a web of resistance. So we need to find people who share our vision, perhaps wanting to confront racism in public schools, as people in this room have provided leadership and have been doing, or concerns about racial profiling, or the lack, lack of elected leaders of color in so many communities, and we need to work together. We can form unlearning racism or anti-racism support groups, create coalitions of people like the Human Rights Commission who want to do something about racism. And while I describe how most people, particularly white people, have their thoughts and feelings unconsciously shaped by the structures and history of this country, the majority of people, including white people, are consciously against racism. So we have to harness the power of our numbers. The third thing I want to talk about involves compassion. I really feel like we have to be compassionate to ourselves and to others. We have to be compassionate to those who are targeted by racism and work unrelentingly to oppose it. But we also have to be compassionate to those who work to unlearn it, which can be a frustratingly slow and messy process. My friend, colleague, and anti-racism activist, Mike Funk, signs his letters, One Love. Nobody in this room designed racism. We're all victims of racism in various ways. It slams doors and constricts opportunities for those who are targeted by it. But it morally compromises those who benefit from it, leading to lives informed by distortions and by fears. I would categorize this work, this way of working against racism, as compassionate, personal, and interpersonal work. It can be painful, such as when an unwanted stereotype floats up from the swamp of your psyche. But such stereotypes will continue to bubble up unless we notice them, reflect on them, think about where we learned them, and what sustains them. Ultimately, this work is liberating and freeing for us all. Guilt, shame, anger, and critical judgment can get in the way of confronting and ultimately exorcising these demons. I think one of Nelson Mandela's greatest legacies was his vision of justice that included a deep capacity for compassion, and it's an essential ingredient in my experience when we work towards racial justice. Lastly, we need to remain engaged in this struggle against racism, one that has last, lasted for centuries and where many people gave their lives as part of that struggle. We need to raise our voices, write letters, sign petitions, 
follow the lead of the raging grannies, demonstrate, elect people like our elected officials in the room tonight who oppose racism and stand for social justice. We need to sponsor legislation like the resolution that was sponsored by Congresswoman Judith Chu in 2012 that formally expressed the regret of the House of Representatives for the Chinese Exclusion Act. There's a lot in our past that needs to be excavated, apologized for, and repaired. And our failure to adequately do this is part of the heritage of racism that continues to defile our country. Some of us, some who we admire in this room today, will engage in acts of civil disobedience to protest laws and policies and practices that harm other people. We also need to work to support laws, as imperfect as they might be, that benefit all of our people. We need to push back against the congressmen and congresswomen who represent predominantly white districts and do not want to see President Obama succeed with anything that he proposes, who want his health care initiative to fail, who don't want, quote, those, unquote, people receiving government benefits. We need not to be rocked back on our heels, but rather what anti-racism activist Bobby Harrow encouraged us to do, make a noise, a deep, resounding clamor demanding universal human rights and social justice for all of our citizens and ultimately for all of the world's population. If we believe that we are all human beings, all members of the only race, the human race, then we all carry the scar of racism and in my view are obligated to heal and overcome the legacy of that scar. So on this 65th anniversary of the signing of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, an act informed by the same ideals that are enshrined in our Constitution that highlights where we have fallen short as well as shining a beacon that illuminates the intentional country that we hope to become. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's in our hands. And I want to quote her. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. For me, unquote. For me, this includes the inner maps that are parts of our psyches and souls. I'm going to, going to finish with a quote from Nelson Mandela. A fundamental concern for others in our individual and community lives would go a long way in making the world a better place that we so passionately dream of. Stay concerned and keep on dreaming. Right now, uh, Lisa Amato and uh, <clears throat> Lisa uh, Gogram uh, first met as colleagues in the Valley Therapist community. I understand there were a few of them in the Valley. And um, they soon learned that they had more in common than their first names. Both had long standing roots in the movements for social change. Among other things, this meant that they knew the words to all the same songs. Uh, and they're hoping that these are songs that you know too. So joining them on mandolin is Brooks Ballinger and organizer with the UAW. Take it away.
Dr. Miller said, yes, let's make a noise together. Um, and of course, our American folk music has helped us to do that by tracking and tracing, promoting and teaching all of us about the various movements for social justice and for human rights. Um, and one of our great sages and social critics was Woody Guthrie. And so we are hoping that you know this song. And if you don't, you will learn this song because it has an awesome chorus. So if you don't know it now, you will in about four or five minutes. <laughs> Reading of the 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights you've heard so much about this evening, and hopefully you've heard more about through the course of your lives. The readers include uh, community leaders and people who have advocated for or have been affected by the specific human rights described in the article they are reading. Please refer to the insert of your program for listening to the people who are reading, and please note that there have been some changes made because some people were unable to come to do readings tonight, so they've been replaced. As people step up, they will introduce themselves. Um, and if you look to your right, you'll see the words of the articles projected on the uh, screen, along with the photographs, uh, illustrating the human rights being described. And we will start with the preamble read by Ward 6 Councilor, City Councilor, Northampton City Councilor, Mary Ann Labarge. The preamble. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of humankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. Whereas it is essential, if men and women are not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Whereas it is essential to promote the development of friendly relations between nations. Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and the worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of all people, and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom. Whereas member states have pledged themselves to achieve in cooperation with the United Nations, the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of the greatest importance for the full realization of this pledge. Now, therefore, the General Assembly proclaims this Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations, to the end that every individual and every organ of society, keeping this declaration constantly in mind, shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure the universal and effective recognition and observance both among the peoples of member states themselves and among the peoples of territories under their jurisdiction. Actually, um, as we do this, if the person, this will be the on deck circle over here. So whoever's on deck can step up and then uh, please introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are. I am Arlo Siegel. I'm Gabriel Feldman Schwartz. And we're representing Northampton Key Club. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit that values the inherent worth and connectedness of all members of the human family. My name is Marjorie Hatch, Article 2. 
everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedom set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, non-self-governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. My name is Yael Petretti. Article three, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Latanya Robinson couldn't make it. I'm Britt Albert, the co-chair of the Unitarian Society of Northampton uh, Social Justice Committee. Article four, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. I'm Nancy Tulanian. Article 5. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. I'm Wendy Berg, legal aid lawyer. Article six, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. I'm Bill Newman, article seven. All are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination in violation of this declaration and against any incitement to such discrimination. I am Susan DeMaria, I'm replacing Chantel. I am a lawyer and I am a union organizer with the National Organization of Legal Services Workers. Everyone has the right to an effective remedy by the competent national tribunals for acts violating the fundamental rights granted by the Constitution or by law. Laura and Charlotte Majumder. Incidentally, Article 9. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, arrest detention, or exile. I'm Elisa Klein. Article 10, everyone is entitled in full equality to fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in the determination of their rights and obligations and of any criminal charge against them. Tanzania Canon Eckerly, Article 11. Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law in a public trial at which he or she has had all the guarantees necessary for their defense. No one shall be held guilty of any penal offense on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a penal offense under national or international law at time when it was committed, nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time the penal offense was committed. I am Josh Levy from Free Press. This is Article 12. Uh, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with their privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon their honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. Victor Nunez, Operation Iraqi Freedom Combat Veteran and public speaker at Veterans Advocacy Services. 
Article 13, everyone has a right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has a right to leave any country, including their own, and to return to their country. Hi, my name is Julio Capo. I'm reading Article 14. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. This right may not be invoked in the case of prosecutions genuinely arising from non-political crimes or from acts on contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. I'm Henry Rosenberg, Article 15. Everyone has the right to a nationality. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality, nor denied the right to change their nationality. Heidi and Gina Norton Smith, Article 16. All people of full age, without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion, have the right to marry and to found a family. They are entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage, and at its dissolution. Marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society as an, and is entitled to protection by society and the state. Pamela Schwartz for the Western Massachusetts Network to End Homelessness. Article 17, everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their property. My name is Tynan Power, Article 18. Everyone has the right of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change their religion or belief, and freedom, either alone or in community, with others and in public or private, to manifest their religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. My name is Larry Parnas, the editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. My name is Ella Napolitano. And I'm Jeff Napolitano. Okay. Uh, Article 20. Everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. No one may be compelled to belong to an association. Ivan Kutcher, Article 21. One, everyone has the right to take part in the government of their country, directly or through freely chosen representatives. Two. Everyone has the right of equal access to public service in their country. Three, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be universal and equal suffrage, and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. <coughs> Every, this is Article 20, 22. Everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation and in accordance with the organization and resources of each state of the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for their dignity and the free development of their personality. John Weissman. I am Kitty Callaghan. Article 23, one. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, 
to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Paragraph two, everyone without discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. <laughs> Paragraph three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration ensuring for themselves and their family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented if necessary by other means of social protection. Paragraph four, everyone has the right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of their interests. Yes. Hi, I'm Rose Bookbinder, union organizer and executive board member of Western Mass Jobs and Justice. Article 24, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. Hi, I'm Wanda Valone. I'm director of uh, Service and Shelter and Housing Division for Hampshire County, and I'm also on the advisory board for the Human Rights Commission. I have Article 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for their health and well-being and that of their family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. And the right to the security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond their control. I'm Liz Friedman. I'm from Mother Woman. Parenthood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. Hi, my name is Valerie Simone. And um, everyone has the right to education, shall be free at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. Elementary education shall be compulsory and technical and professional. Education shall be made greatly available and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. Hey, I'm Raphael. I'm a student. Education shall be directed to the, to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, rad racial or religious groups. It shall further the activities of the United Nations for the main maintenance of peace. Valerie again. Um, parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. I'm Penny Burke from the Northampton Center for the Arts. This is Article 27. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which they are the author. Jane Fleischman. And Joan Tabachnik. Article 28. Everyone is entitled, entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can, can be fully realized. I'm Cara Eau Claire, the chair of the um, Smith Stand Organization at Smith College. This is an anti-genocide organization. Article 29. Everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of their personality is possible. In the exercise of their rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. These rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. I'm 
Claudia Lefko, the director of the Iraqi Children's Art Exchange and coordinator of Baghdad Resolve, an international collaboration to improve cancer care in Iraq. I'm last. Nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, group, or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set forth herein. The Lisa's and Brooks will uh, perform with Brooks, you're not, no? Okay. All right, Brooks is sitting down. And you, of course. Here's a chorus I want to teach you. Some of you may know this song. It's by Tommy Sands. Your daughters and your sons? Yeah? Okay, good. So the chorus goes like this. Your daughters and your sons, your daughters and your sons, you don't hate them. <laughs> your daughters and your sons, your daughters and your sons, you've sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. That's it. So easy. Your daughters and your sons. Your daughters and your sons, you've sown the seeds of freedom in your daughters and your sons. Okay. So, we would like to sing this song in remembrance and in gratitude to the life and the work of Nelson Mandela. Freedom. 